Antonio, Stacy, and Pico on the motion in this house would not allow individuals below a certain income level to invest in cryptocurrency. I'd like to call the Prime Minister. Yeah. Yeah. premises to be used by take by also process to the day progressive. Cryptocurrency is extremely unregulated and extremely volatile yeah. as it exists and will continue to increase in volatility. Second, with the allure of quick riches, the majority of uh, middle to poor income individuals use tend to use things like their life savings, tend to use things like their limited liquidated property to try to invest in cryptocurrency. And thirdly, None of us, not even the smartest people, can pinpoint the date at which Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies will burst. So the responsibility of all the process is to try to find a way to minimize the risks of that inevitable burst from happening. Is anything being done or can any opposition team argue that they can make the situation better? At best, what they can argue are things like financial literacy programs or trying to educate people more about the, the, the harms of cryptocurrency. We think that will never be enough because the only people who really can truly understand the concept of cryptocurrency, of complex financial instruments, are the really privileged individuals who can access this information or who can have, like, you know, spendable income to try to play around with cryptocurrencies. So what do we have to prove coming from the first team to open the semifinals? First, that the amount of risk is not is enough to merit some form of government regulation. And secondly, that there are less damaging ma macroeconomic effects when we do limit it to a certain income level. Okay. What is our policy? Our first problem for policy is to treat it like a sophisticated instrument. What does this mean? Currently, in status quo, there are things called complex instruments and investments, meaning only a subset of people can actually play around with these things. These are things like hedge fund investments, structured deposits, yeah. private placements, asset and asset backed securities. Yeah. All of these words simply mean that only a pool of accredited investors can access these complex financial instruments and can only be traded by such individuals. We're also going to force cryptocurrency exchanges to limit the to limit the distribution of Bitcoin by asking people to show proof of financial capacity before they are allowed to purchase or before they're allowed to trade. Obviously we don't give we don't need to give an absolute value for this number, but we're going to peg it at anything below high income households. So we're limiting access here to maybe upper B to higher income A individuals on our side. What are we going to trade off coming from opening up then? Obviously, we'll take the argument that yes, poor and middle income individuals won't have access to this. But with the two and with the two arguments I'll provide you, I'll prove to you why that's necessary. First argument, better for consumer financial protection. Do you think the government exists in so far as to protect consumers from making poor financial decisions? What is the difference with lower income individuals and higher income individuals? It's a concept of buffer income. Buffer income that exists so you can prevent like extreme losses of income or you can shoulder the cost of your investment not giving you a high enough return of investment. And that is extremely important when you talk about cryptocurrencies for two reasons. The first reason is there's a lot of risk involved in cryptocurrencies. Obviously, it's extremely speculative to how much Bitcoin is valued because there's no central bank. Secondly, since there's no central bank, no one controls the limit of Bitcoin, which means it's valued as like, you know, highly volatile. It jumps at like, you know, a couple thousand dollars every now and then. So that's the first reason the why you need buffer income to be able to sustain the losses that can come out of these very realistic risks. Second reason why you need buffer income that only exists in high income individuals is that there's extreme capitalism required for you to be a successful Bitcoin investor. With currently, to mine a single Bitcoin, you need 24 computers that operate around the clock for you to solve complex algorithms, for you to just generate one Bitcoin. There's an extremely high bar of entry when you talk about being a successful Bitcoin investor. You understand that poorer and middle income individuals can just buy tiny shares of Bitcoin. But again, it's actually worth the trade-off for you to risk your life savings to get a simple slice of that pie, given how risky that the pile will go rotten at some certain point. So we think we're going to differentiate it, right? What we would prefer for and middle income households to prefer are things like time deposits, which are more, do have less risk and have less reward, but are guaranteed not to lose their money. Even even if we're forced to defend it, we're also, like, we're, we're also willing for them to invest in stocks. Because at least you know the company you're investing into, you can access financial reports by Googling it. Compared to cryptocurrencies and compared to Bitcoin, which there's no like cohesive type of information because it's all speculative and there's no centralization. Let's demonstrate like what actually happens to people. What you have are people using their life savings to buy a single 
price of Bitcoin that will condemn them in like you know poor financial conditions for the rest of their life because they will be constrained by debt. Or most in most instances, for them to buy a Bitcoin, they have to go into debt and use their house, use their single car as collateral to be able to enter this market. So these decisions affect them on a long-term run when you talk about the financial incapacity that you're going to put them in because of unbridled debt. But prefer the second argument, yes. So far all you're arguing against is people investing too much. But the rich can also overinvest. Following that logic, are you also willing to limit how much they can put in? Yeah. Yeah. No, the argument that presented to you was for you to invest in Bitcoin, you need buffer income because the market is extremely risky. So even if rich individuals invest a lot of money, then they can recoup that cost. Compared to poorer individuals which don't have that unique nuance of the type of market that Bitcoin currently exists. So why do we think high income individuals won't have won't be susceptible to the same type of risks? One, they're only investing amounts that they are willing to lose compared to poor or middle income individuals in which whatever amount they, do, they are going to put in is the amount that they shouldn't be losing in general. But the second difference is rich individuals have assets they can liquidate in the case that they need to pay off debt. But poor individuals in the case where they are burdened of debt don't have like we think are less likely of assets that can be liquidated to pay off those debts. Second, how are we going to prevent like uh, like harmful macroeconomic parts? Do you think this is also the principal analysis that if ever a market fails, it's always the government that steps up and tries to bail everyone out and try to make sure that the economy isn't worse off? There are two reasons that we provided you earlier why right? there's a lot of debt that could happen in terms of poor individuals. The idea of capital, uh, high capitalization, the idea that they want to get more Bitcoin so they will borrow, probably be successful and use that money again to borrow and get more Bitcoin. Why is this harmful? Bubbles only burst when there's a lot of unpaid debt that doesn't get paid. That happens when a lot of poor middle-income individuals get into that market and don't really have much of a better problem trying to navigate that market for them. But secondly, bubbles burst when people are blinded by it, are excited by just entering that market very fast. And do we think that they don't have the information to process good financial decisions relating to Bitcoin? So we think these are the intrinsic parts that come whenever like people who are not equipped with one, the financial know-how, and two, the financial resources to trade in Bitcoin. Compared to our policy, the idea of complex financial institutions being able to want, being the ones to handle these complex instruments, which we think does bring the status quo. Why is this? So let's assume, let's be generous to opposition, and let's assume that even the high-income individuals fail on our side and they don't make the same good decisions. At least that is more concentrated between a few sets of individuals who becomes here. easier to pay, becomes easier to trace who your creditors are. Compared to tens and thousands of individuals spread across tens and thousands of households, where it becomes very hard to collect on your debt, especially because there's no central bank, there's no regulation, and people can anonymously trade this amount. Here. And this is why we think we, our economy, in the very worst case of any subclass in this time, will be better off. We are very proud to open this time. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Neither of you. arbiter of how your hard work should be actualized should never be the state, but it should be the individual, especially when all of the harms are not concentrated on society, but on the individual themselves. What are we talking about, right? Because they wanted to parallelize Bitcoin to something that is entwined, intertwined with the economy. That's the first rejection of rate. Because we say that unlike banks or stocks, these coins are not intertwined with your economy. What we need, you need credit because they understand that the money being taken out from the bank is money that is directly tied to the state. The money that you are spending on Bitcoin relies only on the assumption of a peer-to-peer -peer network. The bank is there money policy, and in Bitcoin, it's just another individual. That's the important context recontextualization that we like to establish. But next, what does the state mean? to begin with. The state intervenes when what? There's a tangible risk to society. Here, That's here. why banks have a credit rating, credit rating system because they understand if your loan messes up, it's going to impact society. But this reg the reason why we don't support like, their form of regulation for Bitcoin is simple. Because the only people who are 
going to feel the impacts of any sort of harm is the individual themselves. The state or the society has no rule anyway. But second, we say even banks let people, people who have a small income in. For example, you are a poor CEO, but because they're able to holistically assess that your investment will be able to make profit in the future, they take a risk on you. So we say even in your model, it's perfectly fine for, the, for like this policy to exist anyway. Before I move on to my, before I move on to my Larger case line. Let's get up to a few denials of let's go up to a few denials from Adrian, right? Because they said that the only people who can understand Bitcoin is privilege. Um, firstly, they have the same uh, the poor people have the same moral calculus as privileged individuals. How does this look like? They're also able to assess risk. They're also able to assess when something bad will happen. In fact, we're going to go far as to say that even the rich can fall prey to bubbles. We're talking about yeah. Yeah. Media. we're talking about billionaires who invest in the internet bubble. You see that individuals are the best arbiter of their work because it's their money and they work quite hard and toil to make that money, not the state. We say that secondly, if their standard is the privilege and intelligent individuals, they're also similarly like are at risk of making bad decisions. So they have to prove that in every situation, they're always going to make good decisions if you're rich. Sorry, Adam. Let's talk about the next discussion, right? Because this debate isn't just about this debate isn't about like what they want to make this debate about. This debate is more about either one, poor people go like the like people with low income create units to invest in Bitcoin, or individuals use Bitcoin to assure them that to back up their savings. Why is this important? Because in the financial crisis and even in Venezuela, when currency, local currency, which also has the same potential to be volatile as Bitcoin, failed, the only reliable standard for them to use to create a profit and to survive economically was. Bitcoin, right? So this is the best moment when the economy fails. Because in both models, there's a plausible, like it's equally plausible for the economy to fail. But the goal that we're trying to prove here is what kind of assurance can we give to the poor people, the rich poor people, the low income people. And the principle that we're trying to prove is why people should have the right, like why people are the best arbiters of how their hard work should be actualized, i.e. to invest in. Before I move on, please. The characterization is it's the best when the economy fails. Realize that if the economy fails, the price of Bitcoin will also crash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will crash because people use it for real transactions in the real world. I already, I already questioned this. You have to prove that it's intertwined with the economy. Yeah. On the idea of self-ownership, right? The state is what allows individuals to decide on what makes their lives meaningful. We see that the only, even if it's speculative, like stocks, we see that the state allows them to dictate what they like because the reason why they're able to inter invest is because it's the hard work of the people. The only power that low income households have is their ability to invest in more hard like in, in, invest in things. And if they're not harmful, I mean if they're not drugs, if there's something that could indirectly or directly benefit the state has no incentive or reason to deter it. Because the only person who should be able to actualize that work, the only person who works for that work, who works for that money, is you therefore you have their like the right to invest it. But secondly, we say that why, what, what really, what really is the status quo, right? Uh, we already discussed to you first why individuals have an every incentive to invest, right? Why is that so? Because even the poor people who have smart, more scarce resources than the rich understand that there is a risk with Bitcoin. I mean, it's common knowledge to know that it's a volatile currency if you're able to see it in the news every day. So what does that mean? More likely the scenario will be they're going to invest in this Bitcoin, but they're not going to invest everything because they understand that if you put all of your eggs in one basket, it's going to leave you, they buy you back in the ass anyway, right? But even in the worst case, where they pay, where, where they pay, they go bankrupt, it's completely fine because the decision is inherent valuable because that's the only way one they're able to actualize the only power they have in society which government wants to rob them of to actualize themselves and make themselves happy but two we say that the state also allows a degree of rationality this is where we talk to you about when the what sort of states the risks allows we say that the state allows risks that are tangible and unlike the, 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 the COVID only allows risks that are taken mitigate right so how is this mitigable one you don't as a growing up person you don't sit around on your ass all day just like mining bitcoins or looking for bitcoins, right? See, secondly, right? What is the best alternative? Then, this is where we talk to you about why the welfare state is actually sufficient, right? Because one, what government needs to prove is, in the majority of cases, every single poor individual will be investing in this cryptocurrency. But you see, typically these are VCs and middle class. But even if, why is it okay? Because one, you see that we're losing what they, we have the right, right to invest what our, we have poor individuals have the right to invest and take risks, the same as everyone else. On government's model, these people become second class citizens and they're treated differently within society. What's the conclusion? We see that one, it's the best way for them to create social enterprise because 
It's only through this that they can get one, a semblance of stability, or two, access to a greater market that the only that is monopolized by the rich, right? What do we say about the welfare state? Why is the welfare state fine? Because one, we're able to pay back the welfare state through taxes. Two, corporations pay taxes as well. So what does this mean? One, we already the poor are already investing constantly in the welfare state anyway. So any sort of benefit or like any sort of um, safety net that they get, they've already paid for. But what's so special about cryptocurrencies? Because even if they're volatile, we say it's completely fine. Because so are tulips, so is the internet bubble. Here, so what here. happened then? At the moment in time tulips failed, the internet failed, if the market stabilized, because one, tulips became a common place, and two, people were able to, with it, after the internet crisis, people were able to create bonds, people were able to here, here. Um, do other internet enterprises. Here, here. What's the importance of this discussion, right? The importance is, one, we're able to mitigate the idea that bubbles are always inherently bad. Two, we're able to maximize the profit and, like, we're able to maximize the profit of these individuals. But three, we give the poor, the low-income families, the best justice in the face of an elitist policy coming from government. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bitcoin, right? The harm is number one, people actually pouring in their life savings. 
savings that would have gone into actual stabler investments like their education, their livelihood, or their children's futures into Bitcoin. Or if not their life savings, ladies and gentlemen, investors can lose their money by capitalizing based on debt. How does this work? We think that investors can lose even more money than they had initially put in by borrowing in order to fund their cryptocurrency habits. Let's like break it down. I'll buy ten thousand dollars worth of coins using two thousand dollars of my own cash and eight thousand dollars of debt. If this ten thousand dollars of Bitcoin drops to one thousand dollars in value because of the inherent volatility that they cannot deny, then we think this is eight thousand dollars of debt that I don't know how to pay for. Why? And multiply that Why? individual investor by tens of thousands of people doing this and investing as amateur investors, ladies and gentlemen. Then you have a bucket load of people in debt in the economy that people can no longer pay off. That is why we need to be able to restrict the access of cryptocurrency for people, for lower net worth individuals who won't be able to have buffer income for their own life savings and won't have buffer income to pay off the debt that will inevitably occur to be able to fund their cryptocurrency habits. Then they told us, no, Bitcoin is the salvation of Venezuela, ladies and gentlemen. We think this is absolutely ridiculous. Look, we understand that states are not perfect, but states by and large are still the most secure form of debt and like investment you can have, right? Because they have the protection of global banks, the protection of their reserves, and the protection of their allies. They have multiple safety debt. Well, Bitcoin is currently unregulated and you will never have any form of protection on your side. But they sell, they say, no, 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 your economy will not be affected because you know what, it's not intertwined with your economy. We already proved to you why it is intertwined with your economy, but secondly, if, look, you can pay for your globe bill with Bitcoin, right? That means you're buying actual things with Bitcoin things. So if your economy fails, then you're also affected within your economy. It is intertwined, and if it's not intertwined, what's the point of buying Bitcoin anyway, right? Just because um, we allow people to gamble in casinos even if it demands your whole house, right? So why are do we automatically disallow people from investing their whole life? Look, in look, this? one, this out of the way. Two, you know what? We're fine. We're fine with that. Like let's not allow yeah. super like uh, like impoverished people from entering into a casino. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's fine, right? Like it's massive debt, and you're not gonna earn a lot. You lose more by betting against the house. Okay, so let's talk about the right choice. We think the right choice is deactivated when you have obscure information, and this is particularly existing when you come to Bitcoin. Let's characterize this obscurity and lack of information, right? Cryptocurrencies are traded through a highly unregulated set of intermediaries today. For me to trade cryptocurrencies, I need to buy one, a Bitcoin exchange to buy and sell coins, and two, get a Bitcoin wallet to be able to store my Bitcoin keys. What are the harms? Number one, clearly there are very massive security flaws in cryptocurrency exchanges now because several exchanges have already been hacked. We don't know how these exchanges are secured. We do not have any via, like, accountability mechanisms when it comes to these exchanges. But even with wallets, how does a consumer, especially a low income consumer, truly know if he can trust a, a, a wallet? We never really know, ladies and gentlemen, that he owns a Bitcoin. There's just a wallet that says, go to Bitcoin. There's so, uh, so you know, you can always, you're always exposed to the risk of being scanned. So you have like a Bitcoin wallet or a Bitcoin exchange that like 10,000 people, they own two Bitcoins, but in reality, they only have two Bitcoins that they provide with the two Bitcoin keys to everybody. But it's not for effect. The idea of this is that there's no way for you to fully understand it, especially when you come into it as a low-income individual. So why do we need to protect them in particular? We think that, number one, they are the most vulnerable because one, moreover, beyond the fact that they don't have buffer income, there are also a larger amount of people who will be affected by this. Like, empirically, a larger amount of the population are composed of lower network individuals. We need to limit the number of the pool of people who are able to enter into this unregulated market. But secondly, we need to regulate it because it's the state who will eventually have to take care of this massive amount of individuals who want to exercise their right to choice, who are exercising this selfless choice to say, I want to be able to be the next Bill Gates, but in reality, that is a far-fetched dream. So we are fine with them not being able, like a few individuals, not being able to make 100 tax returns. If it means that the rest of the economy will be safe, and it means that we protect the more of individual, no network individuals from gambling away from their life from without the post.
coming from the previous speaker, her last case was that, well, there's information symmetry. Because of the fact that there are security flaws that these poor, poor people do not want to know about. The first thing, then wouldn't we, then that means, shouldn't we ban cryptocurrency for everyone because there is a security flaw? But secondly, the fact that everyone knows what cryptocurrency is about, and the fact that the media is always talking about its security flaws and its, uh, and its speculative benefits, that means that the reach is overall to everyone here and here, that before the investor are already aware that there are types of risks of every time invest with these kinds of things. But the second case study here was that in 2010, when, the, uh, when Bitcoin became stagnated because of the hats and a lot of speculations about it, it became stable again because of the types of reforms that people had in that type of system, Mr. Speaker. What does this example prove? It proves that regardless of the security flaws, that there are reforms with, that are be willing to be done in that type of system. Then that means why aren't we being able to do that in status quo right now? Or why can we do it in the future? Sit down. The, then I ask the POI, are you also going to stop poor people from gambling inside casinos? This is a principled argumentation because regardless of the types of harms we have to that type of individual, the state still allows you to be involved in unsafe sex, even if the cause is HIV AIDS or an epidemic at the end of the day because the harms are only to you as an individual. There was no proving coming from their side of the likelihood that the mar large majority of shareholders or investors in that Bitcoin are poor people. The fact that they said that you need a large amount for you to invest in that, that means that there is less incentive for pe poor people already to go in. Why do we need to have a that you can't invest in it just because you're poor? Sit down. Let's talk about this idea about accredited investors. But we need to prove the burden that the Bitcoin now is overwhelmingly intertwined with the economy. The fact that it only shares like less 1% of the transactions that we have means that, that there is only less harm or the harm is only individualized, Mr. Speaker. But what if the harm is 10% or 20%? We're still willing to do that because speculative stocks are already available to poor people or even the unsafe sex is already practiced by everyone, right? We think that in Cyprus, when Bitcoin, when uh, when we had a financial crisis, what was their last resort when banks failed, failed and their currency was devaluated? It was the Bitcoin, Mr. Speaker, that the poor people relied on for their uh, for their investments or for their savings, Mr. Speaker, to make it every day. We think that under their model, the only alternative that they have are banks that are not assured in the very first place, even in a financial crisis, or currencies that are also volatile, Mr. Speaker, that come from the sun told, we told you that we allow poor people also to invest in currencies, even if it's very volatile in status quo. While big do they invest, we know there was no clear analysis of how big they invest. We might think that this might just be 40 pesos of a big Mr. Speaker, or even 1,000 pesos. We know that poor people, poor people don't, want, don't have the capacity to invest that. But let's talk about the idea and be about coming from PM. Coming from PM, he told us that the reason why we only allow rich people or credited investors invest in a certain product is because they have technical knowledge. Yeah. Then why do they assume that poor people can't have technical knowledge yeah. when we told you that these kinds of things can be available through media or through exposure to the types of information that they have? If they know that there are risks to Bitcoin, are they now willing to allow them to invest in that? Because if rich people can invest in Bitcoin, even if there are, a lot of speculative harms and a lot of harms, why are they not going to stop those individuals whose whole company or whose life savings as a middle class or upper class person might also rely on that type of investment? But let's talk about what should the state's role be? Because there was no response to the principled argumentation that we told you that it's only the people who can determine where their money should go and what are the types of harms and risks that they can solve. It was not clear on how the state now stops you from investing in a Bitcoin whose nature is not interplant to the economy we, uh, we, we have right now. Uh, that means that the harm is individualized. It's only you can determine the harms and benefits and make life meaningful. So they need to tell us why that now harm is collectivized or is distributed to other individuals, especially if it's just a very, very small product. For what sure. Look, it's not just 40 pesos, right? Right now, a Bitcoin costs 600,000 on the market. So we need to be able to understand that it's not like going to be us. Maybe they need like to prove to us that the poor person can make 600,000. Yeah. 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 Let's talk about this thing becomes overwhelming. So 
Because in, in that market these days, where you can only invest on what risks you can take, what's the harm here? Missed opportunities. Because he told you in stock in the past, if we allow poor people to invest in two lips or even in the internet, because it eventually it stabilized and it became commonplace, right? That's where you had blogs or even entrepreneurs who set up those types of websites. We need that opportunities lost under their side when they, these people could be the first entrepreneurs to make most out of that money here, here. after there is already a stabilization that's going to occur. They need to prove to us why stability is not going to happen. We agree that a, a bubble might burst, but we think that this is where it's more, uh, more likely for these people to do that. But what if there is a harm that they lose all of their life savings? We're fine with that because experience is cathartic and we told you coming from Gaston that the welfare state is highly invested already through taxes that those people already pay, right? So if the moment that they do lose a lot of money, there's still a fallback for them from the state because the state allowed them to take that risk, Mr. Speaker. We think that alternative uh, we think that uh, what about other uh, the stock alternatives or alternatives for investment? We think that this is not as better as a Bitcoin because these stocks might not have the same momentum as Bitcoin has right now. What this means is that you have lost the opportunity under their side where only the rich can have the capacity to exploit that opportunity to make a lot of profits. We think under our side, what you do is that it equalizes all opportunities regardless of your poor or rich, right? Because we think that even if they fail, it's a cathartic experience that they don't have necessary to blame the same of taking that uh, risk. Because anyway, the choice is informed, informed in the very first place. And their vision of what a good future looks like was somewhat tried or risked, right? We need what is the conclusion of this debate. We need the fault coming from Ateneo was that they did not really tell us on how that individualized part will trickle down to the rest of the economy. They treated Bitcoin as if it was a real estate uh, real estate thing that is intertwined to a lot of economies, right? The fact that not any one of us here owns a Bitcoin means that there are only few individuals who could do that, only few individuals have invested in that. What's the conclusion of this debate? The conclusion of this debate is that there is the only individual who knows the hearts and benefits and we should allow that individual to take risks because that's the only time when this person can feel some form of catharsis that at least I tried in my dream to invest in that type of thing. For all these reasons, we're very proud of the most number of LLC. Uh, thanks, CLO. I'd like to welcome the closing half, Member of Government. Here, here, here. Yeah, okay. We're going to promise that it can become a viable alternative and 
Well, how are we going to do that? We're going to make sure that only people with a stable income can practice Bitcoin and can, can, can participate in, in this new currency, right? And if you want to make the poor access Bitcoin, then it's the job of the state to raise them at a level of economic stability or raise them at a level of income stability so that they can participate in Bitcoin. It's an even better incentive for the state. I have a few rebuttals for opening opposition first. They said that maybe Bitcoin doesn't matter anymore, so why don't you just ban Bitcoin if you want it to become exclusivist, right? But the, the benefit still stands because investment in a currency is the goal. Because stable income people will invest back to the state, for example, out of the investment they make in Bitcoin. They will invest back in Bitcoin by being honest in their ledgers, even, even with the anonymity clause in Bitcoin, right? Because these things will still generate capital and make economies work. We think that that's an important value that they weren't able to answer. And secondly, they said that people will, uh, sometimes people are only reliant on Bitcoin because it can help them generate income. But the assets we didn't the time is the only choice that they had at hand. So that's not a harm, it's a symptom of something larger. So the, how the government should have responded is, poor people should have been able to stabilize their income so that they can properly participate in Bitcoin. That's why you had emotional spurts of investment that made money value this high in this particular day and this moment and this other day, right? And because of these emotional spurts, no one believes in Bitcoin anymore because of the open access to Bitcoin. We think that it's important for us to be able to achieve people, people's belief in a currency in order for it to be viable. Second, and uh, thirdly, they said that you, will, you, you have to allow people the, an open access to all of their choices, right? But the thing is, when you, uh, in, in their world, the state is complicit in people feeling the need to invest in an unviable currency. Because it's the same when people, when, when lotteries are famous, for example, or get rich quick schemes, schemes or pyramid schemes are popular, for example. It's because individuals don't even don't anymore feel the security in their own currency. That's why they, that's why they practice something else, right? We think that that's not the same with Bitcoin because it can become a viable currency. The harm is happening in status quo because it's not pro it's not properly being used. We think that only people with stable income can make people believe in Bitcoin again. So I have um, the extension will be about number one, we only allow individuals to use Bitcoin because it, it's an alternative to their money, it's not the only choice. And secondly, why we're going to discuss why the right what well, like why it's not the right that all individuals have. Firstly, let's talk about the comparison of the psyche of a stable income person and a low income person. Someone with an okay income already has money, right? So when they use Bitcoin, they try Bitcoin. Like it's a, it's a second debit card, for example. But they can access goods online, for example, that's better because that's better than stealable information from an ATM card, right? Because of the anonymity clause. But in comparison with someone with low income, they, their intent is to increase income rapidly. This means that individual action will affect everyone. I'm going to argue further because this was only argued in a limited, uh, a very limitedly on opening door. The emotional spurt of investment makes Bitcoin value so high on Monday and so low on Saturday, right? That means there's so much tolerance for tolerance for gov from government and makes government forget that low people and low, people of low income have to be guided to sustainable decisions. Here, here. Access to Bitcoin here. even makes them more vulnerable to like miners, for example, or hackers, for example. Because here. when everyone uses here, Bitcoin, here. a lot of the modes of a lot of the modes of payment in the economy will go to cryptocurrency because there is a demand for a lot of cryptocurrency because of the wide access to that. This means that open access to Bitcoin keeps poor people even further down the drain because the demand the, because of the high demand there, right? But even but when they go there, they're super vulnerable. So the goal is to not create that much demand in Bitcoin because it's like it's going to change the system for everyone. You have to limit the demand. Uh, you have to limit the demand of an alternative currency versus a versus an already existing currency. Right? So we have to only limit, it, limit the demand of Bitcoin to those that can afford it after this. So meaning, it's going back to the basic premise that the practice of uh, that practicing the use of a currency solidifies a currency at best. So meaning, you have to keep it as an alternative to already existing uh, already existing currencies and already existing modes of payment. Because for poor people, you have to help them get income so they can invest in Bitcoin and then they can properly use the currency and make the currency viable. That's something that the state can generate incentive to make it better for everyone so everyone can participate and Bitcoin can also become a properly regulated currency. Open your opposition. So I'm going to talk about how this is not the right that all individuals have. Because it's not the state's obligation to make you rich, right? It's not the state's obligation to make you super rich. It's not the state's obligation to make everyone up to have to make everyone like have houses or have house lots or have millions of dollars, things like that. It's only the state's obligation to give you a stable income so you can properly participate in the economy. And that economy is already open to other alternative currencies like Bitcoin. So meaning the state uh, the state has to recognize Bitcoin as an as an alternative, as an emerging currency. But in order for it to be viable, it will only happen when it is practiced properly. And a stable value, when, when, when Bitcoin reaches a stable value,
value so that you can com compare it against the euro, for example, or against the dollar, for example. That only happens when you have individuals who have the proper intent in investing and practicing Bitcoin. And unfortunately, those individuals are only those who have a stable who have a stable income. Because if you give it to individuals who have low income, their only intent is to get richer and not participate in an emerging currency. So you have to keep Bitcoin with barriers to control the demand for Bitcoin. What happens in their world? There's access to everyone. That's the reason why all these all, uh, the, these all these economic bubbles will burst, right? But uh, in a row, the biggest benefit is incomes will adjust so that they can participate in an alternative currency. It's an incentive for the state to make individuals uh, to make individuals participate in an alternative currency and in the economy as a whole because they're more stable now. They can participate in other um, in, in other economic goals of the state. We think that because of these particular benefits, uh, because because of these particular ben benefits, individuals can of course uh, uh, individuals are of course important actors in the practice of a currency, but in, in order for that currency to be viable in the first place, we have to limit it to those who can prop, uh, who can participate and properly contribute to its viability. Thanks. Here, here. Thank you, Member of Doug, Member of how Bitcoin works, as well as the reason why every problem talked to you about by government bench will be solved by allowing universal access to here, 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 here. including and especially the problem of Bitcoin price volatility. Here, here. The exclusive contribution of closing opposition is not just to talk about statistics, but why those statistics operate the way that they do, the technical minutia that's necessary in this debate. And this is the reason why I'm going to integrate a lot of my responses. Because a lot of the reasons why we have these problems is because of a lack of knowledge into how things work to begin with. The first thing I want to take a look at is the principle of currency. Because in order for any currency to be stable at the end of the day, it must be free to access, must be universal in nature, and should have no barriers to entry for three reasons. First, it is because it only, it's only when it's universally accessible can you maximize how it can empower individuals on the ground as a medium of exchange, traded as assets, etc., etc., is if everybody can be equally empowered by the same currency. Secondly, it is when you have a free flow of currency can you create a more accurate market estimation of prices, both in demand and supply, which means that it is less likely for speculation attacks to occur, less uncertainty, and it also means that in the future, less, it is also less likely for bubbles to burst. Thirdly, to the extent that it is likely to burst, that's still the same harm that you run for every single currency. Okay. Some currencies in the foreign exchange market are harder to access for the poor. Some of them are also more volatile. In fact, what you would say is most central banks are unable to prevent currency devaluation, especially before financial crisis, because speculation is a universal concern. So what you would say is if you're willing to let the poor and the middle class invest in these areas that are like in the middle kind of um, risk and also allow them to invest in government bonds which are less risky, you should recognize the whole spectrum and allow those choices for everybody to begin with. Why is this important? Four reasons why. First reason is that any empowerment for the rich and the poor can only come when there are no barriers to access that discriminate on arbitrary class structures. Second, free access lessens information asymmetry associated with bubble bursting under their model. It allows economists and people in the school of eco in the school of economics to map trends transparency uh, transparently to lessen the same speculations that government wants to solve. Thirdly, if you're allowing the poor and the middle class to invest in foreign currency, risky ventures, even gambling according to Albert, it means that different levels of risk are recognized by the state in order for individuals on the ground to be able to path their own way towards their own economic mobility. And this is an outcome-independent principle that they never wanted to recognize on the government bench. But fourth and finally, there's a special nuance to Bitcoin, not having a central bank. What you would say is it's more volatile if governments regulate. And this is where I also want to directly respond to the government. Because the reason why people even want to, in, to invest in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies is for 
criticizing because of a lack of government regulation. So the previous speaker can just assert that with more government regulation, it will become more stable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's going to be stable, it's because nobody is demanding it. Yeah. 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 This is the this matter. This, the reason why it is so fearful for us right now is because of Russia calling for more regulations. And it's precisely why people are starting to fear Bitcoin because of two reasons. First, government policies like the ones introduced in government bridge increase the fear of a crash, ladies and gentlemen. The perception of the, the likelihood of the crash. And this is why people are more likely to pull out. And this means that the prophecies that you're going to uh, run on government bench become self-fulfilling because of government bench's policy. But secondly, the reason why people are even um, investing is because there's no government intervention, which means that it's less likely for them to be tied to the volatility of their own currency. But the second discussion I want to take a look at is why access specifically for Bitcoin is the best way to solve all of their problems. So while the first discussion was about currency in general, no thank you, this is one on Bitcoin specifically. In February 2017, the University of California, Berkeley, um, published a study on the reasons behind Bitcoin price volatility. Here are their findings. Firstly, the price of Bitcoin is dependent on demand uh, on the demand for the currency in a way that's special to cryptocurrency. In that, the price is not reliant on most financial indicators that regulate international yeah. interest rates. The reason for this is that they are separate from governments, meaning that they're also separate from the mainstream economy. So even if we're talking about the product economy, that's separate from the imaginary community that well, in the international sphere at the end of the day. And yeah. this means that Adrian was wrong when he said the link is indelible. In fact, the link is more established because of government policy. Price instead is dependent on people's desire for Bitcoin. There is in fact a positive correlation fun fact now, with the volume of Wikipedia searches, which means that it is about the demand and access to it that allows it to be more stable at the end of the day. But secondly, it is untrue that because access access means that access means volatility. In fact, more access means more stability in the long run because there is a limit to the amount of Bitcoins that can be present in the yeah, system. Yeah. It's 21 million, by the way. So if you hit that limit or you approach that limit, it lessens that uncertainty. Yeah, it becomes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, wait a guess. It lessens that uncertainty. And this means that demand and supply curves don't think you're easier to map, predict, and adapt to. But how do you reach that 21 million under our model? It's through access. Why is this so? How do we even create Bitcoins? It's through miners. Miners are there to verify transactions, which means that the more transactions there are, the closer and closer we get to hitting that 21 million stable point. But secondly, we would also respond to Katz, and to Albert, and that it's not 40 pesos long, it's 700 who can access that? That's false matter yeah. because you can buy Bitcoin denominations for as low as one million. Yeah. And, and if you divide 700,000 by one million, that's 0.7 pesos, right? So really, 40 pesos is already very expensive, right? The point is, the reason why it is unstable right now is because of a lack of access for everybody at the end of the day. And what we would say is the effect of a discriminatory policy, the economic and political efficacy for the poor, is that the government message that you create is because you're poor, even though you're rational, even if you map out your risk rationally and said it was worth it, the state doesn't believe you can handle it because you are poor, ladies and gentlemen. You can spin it however you like on government, but this is how people will respond to this message, right? We agree with closing government, it's not the state's responsibility to make you rich. It is the state's responsibility to make sure not to have equality of outcomes, but equality of opportunity. And coming from you, you UPD, we beg you to side with this equality. Thanks.
The world that we're living in is increasingly, increasingly becoming absorbed by technology. That's why Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is an inevitable part of the future. But the question is, how do we ease into integrating cryptocurrency into our economic system? Because that was the nuance that came from ESA, which was very important. Our nuance is, we do not uh, we agree that there is a possibility that cryptocurrency can be used for good, right? Coming from opposition. But the question is, how do we best get there? Is it when we jolt and shock beat the system into letting a wide axis of individuals access it right now, immediately? Or is it when we contain and stabilize it first? Because the very thing is, even the EU, even the world right now, even, you know, we don't even know how do we best go about Bitcoin right now. That's exactly why we don't think that it's a good idea when we let a wide number of people, low-income people, into the market. Because the problem of opposition side is this. The opposition bench keeps on telling us that, oh, Bitcoin is good enough for all our problems, and they just keep on reporting every single thing that we say without telling us how their world even looks like. What would a world with a lot of low-income people having access to Bitcoin immediately be? Because here's the thing, right? The pro if, oh, if the member of opposition's extension is that you know, stability, instability of Bitcoin is a result of a lack of access, we say that it's not access in and of itself is not ultimately a good thing when talk about Bitcoin. Especially when you think about it, the problem of the, the reason why, for example, why even state right now limits the ability of individuals of different income levels of to participate in the economy. For example, you don't allow individuals to get a loan when they're below if they can provide a security if they're below a particular loan. Or for example, the state manages interest rates or the state puts caps on certain corporations. Oh, Sit down, no, thank you. It's simply because the state understands that certain actors of certain income levels are more likely to act a particular way. And this action does not only affect them, mind you, it doesn't only affect your housewife or your daughter player who wants to get a few bitcoins. It affects the rest of the state. And that's exactly and that's exactly why this debate is about likelihoods. And this debate is proving about the likelihood of why actors on their side are more likely to be rational. When you told me that more likely the reason um it more the more likely um the more likely way that these individuals will act is to uh, actually um is more uh, the, the likely action of these individuals is to give their all and to and when that happens that it will increase demand. And when you increase demand, what? you make it Bitcoin more and more vulnerable. And that's exactly what we don't want. But what is the new one? No, thank you. What is the new one between these actors and those of um, and those of a high income? Why do we allow them anyway? Because here's the thing. Even if, for example, even if, for example, a bubble can exist in both models, the thing is, when is a bad bubble more likely to happen? Because everybody can see it's wrong. A bubble is more likely to happen when you have an imagined demand for something that isn't worth anything at all. For example, if you look at the housing bubble, it was because a lot of middle-income people actually invested in mortgages, and that actually made it collapse, right? Which is why the same thing happens with Bitcoin. No, thank you. Because the other thing, the, the same thing happens with Bitcoin. When you have immediately a wide access of individual, and this is because of blue was from OG, we have a lot of people actually immediately entering into Bitcoin without having paid the financial um, it, it was it's more likely for in the bubble compared to our side that even if on the worst case the rich people of um, the rich people will actually incur a bubble, the point is A, it should they fail, they can incur the they can incur the cost. What will your husband do? What will your daughter player do? Are you gonna eat moyo and just live with it? The point is the point is you can and, and they're gonna be relaxed. And the thing is when they do fail, when they do get poor, they're gonna be relied on the state, on their taxpayers, and that's something that's also worse on their side. But the thing but the thing here, ladies and gentlemen, is that at least on our side, should a bubble happen it's a it's a smaller bubble that will pop there's is a much bigger bubble that will drown everyone else on the ground. But what else is not talking about your part? So off we make your job to compare why your bigger bubble is the less harm and a prettier bubble here, here. on our side. Uh, but furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, what exactly um what exactly no thank you? What exactly is what exactly is opposition's best case? Their best case is oh as long as I have a computer I can buy it at one million dollars or one thousand, the point is I can buy it, right? I can have a chance that my one bitcoin might be worth ten million and I'll be an instant millionaire, or I can improve myself and go against the structural inequality and such that we belong to the elite. First of all, the point is, Isa told you that um, Isa told you that the state's responsibility isn't isn't necessarily to make you as rich as possible, right? That means to say, ladies and gentlemen, that for so long as the state can help you, the question of the for, for so long as the state can help you, you're perfectly fine. You can access your food, you can go to school. That's perfectly fine. But the question, second question is, if you want to change inequality, if you want to improve the lives of poor people, why should it be through Bitcoin? Why should it be this way specifically? Because we say, ladies and gentlemen, that the problem that we have with it as a way for poor people to be uplifted of their social economic status, that it's not sustainable.
sustainable. It's something that can go away. And that's why we say that all the alternatives of improving, no thank you, of improving their lives is much better on our side because we can still improve them through all the means of battling of, of no thank you letters to uh, tax, re tax reformation or land redistribution or other means to uplift the economy that's more sustainable and it's not likely to different and it's not likely to change no thank you to uh, not likely to change just because of the demand of individuals. Because if you look at it, individuals are selfish. Even if they're rational as they say, they're not gonna make the best financial decision. They're gonna make up they're gonna make no thank you. They're gonna make decisions that's best for themselves. That means it is determined that even if you think about it, you have a lot of ten million selfish people, ultimately they might make decisions that might be bad for the economy. And that's exactly and that's something that they have to respond to because naturally, why would I just because I'm rational, that doesn't ultimately translate to financial decisions. That's why the state always intervenes. That's why the state changes taxes. That's why the state doesn't let you get a loan. Because even if you're rational and I want to get a loan, no thank you because I know it's profitable for me to have a business, right? And I'm not gonna make bad decisions decisions. Sometimes people give their own because they sometimes we, sometimes these people give their own and when they do fail in German uh, and when they do fail, it's always the state that's going to answer to them and always other individuals who are going to pay for their breath. But furthermore, ladies, <coughs> but furthermore, <laughs> why is that important? And why is closing government important? Because even if there are some premises that we do share from opening government, the important conclusions come from her. The conclusion of the new ones of the white access and how that's bad. Because a white access immediately changes your system into one that dogs into Bitcoin. Right now, when your other systems, when your state, when your families are not ready to absorb the shocks and the costs that come with it. When individuals make selfish decisions that affect every single other person. That's exactly, that's the point with Bitcoin. Because the problem with opposition is they keep on giving us a rebuttal say just because there's a risk. There's, there, the state allows, for example, for people to make risky business decisions that's called data to gamble and something else in the government for closing opposition. But they have to prove what makes this risk so important or what makes this risk different. Because they, because I almost said it itself, this risk cannot be estimated or cannot be predicted by the state financial indicators. This risk are much more fluctuating. These risks are much greater and they're more rapid. They're not like your stocks, they're not like your bonds, which are which they still you know change and fluctuate, but at a smaller degree of consequence. So for all those reasons, ladies and gentlemen, the risk is not worth it. The future is Bitcoin, but it's not now because we have to adjust and continue and stabilize the currency. Thank you, Government Whip. Let's welcome the last speaker of the room. Because of the fact that access allowed people to make it more stable because it reached the 21 
billion more, or is approaching the 21 billion more as fast as we talk about it. But even if you look at it, government seems to be confused as to how cryptocurrency should be treated in status quo. Personally speaking, open government wanted to say that they're specialized investments and therefore should be treated differently. When shafted by closing government by saying that they wanted them to be a regular, a regularized part of society and wanted to be. Treat 
that just like any other currency that we allow people to partake in. But even in the technical level, the document will be lessen the volatility and ensure a future when we have stable outcomes and stable predictions of what it will look like in the next few days, next few weeks, next few months. You only get that by allowing people to access it. You only get that through the extension of CAP. For all these reasons and more, we're very proud of you. Yeah.